Hi everyone, welcome to the Arithmetic Zone. Here we have a new series for you guys on geometric proofs. So proofs are a part of geometry that really geometry isn't anything without proofs. They make up the bulk of a high school geometry class, which is what we're going to be primarily covering in this series, more specifically Regents Geometry from New York. But it is apl applicable to most high school level classes and proofs really teach you a different level of mathematical diff uh, thinking practices than most other math classes like algebra one or even calculus down the line. So it is really useful to learn this stuff early. And so I just wanna go over the process of doing proofs with you guys. But before we get to that, we need to cover some basic geometric principles just so that when we get to proofs, we can feel more comfortable with them. These are things that you need to know cold. And so let's go on with our first property, the reflexive property. And it states that an angle, line, segment, or shape is always congruent to itself. Now, that definition doesn't give us a lot to work with. But even beyond that definition, I want to focus on this word congruent. Oh, I apologize. That highlighter is rather big. But this word congruent, that might be a new word for us, especially coming out of Algebra 1. But I want to... Well, first, let me draw the symbol for congruency. That's what it is. It's basically just an equal sign with that little squiggly line on top. And that's really what it signifies. Congruency just means equal. But it's specifically when referring to angles or line segments of some geometric figure, like a shape. So instead of saying angle A is equal to angle B, the proper way would be to say angle A is congruent to angle B. Etc. Cetera, Etc. Cetera. Now back to this definition: an angle, line, segment, or shape that is always that is always congruent to itself. That doesn't give us a lot to work with. So for our example, we're going to demonstrate it separately so that we can further break that down. Our next definition is, or our next theorem, I should say, is our symmetric property, which is that if one side of an equation is equal to the other side, then they are interchangeable. Now this is just a really fancy way of saying that you can swap the left and right hand sides of an equation, something that you should be familiar with in algebra and something that should honestly just come naturally to you. It should come intuitively. So I have if some number A is equal to some number B, then B is equal to A. And in a more geometric sense, if angle A is congruent to angle B, then angle B is congruent to angle A. We just swap the two different sides of the equation, and that's all. Now we have the transitive property. If two separate angles or line segments are equal to the same angle or line segment, then those separate quantities are equal. That's a lot of words. So we're going to go in with an example. If we have two separate values, A and C, we don't know the values of A and C. For all we know, they're completely unrelated. But we know that A is equal to B and C is equal to B. Well, if these two numbers are equal to the same thing, then it should stand to reason that A and C are also equal. And the substitution property is our next one, where if A plus B is equal to C, then C can replace A plus B in any expression. Now, you would normally take a high school geometry class right after a class like Algebra 1, where you're introduced to the basics of algebra. And this is a really common, um, fundamental algebraic concept. So especially when you're working with like systems of equations and stuff. So I don't feel the need to show an example for that. Now moving on to our addition and subtraction properties. This is, again, another basic algebra concept where if you have an equation with two values on either side of the equal sign, adding or subtracting by the same value on both sides doesn't change the value of the equation. The two values are still going to be equal. Kind of like how if I have 6 is equal to 6, if I subtract by 2 on both sides, I'm going to get 4 is equal to 4. The equation is still true. And it's the same thing for our multiplication and division properties. If you multiply the same number on both sides of the equation, it'll still be equal. And with division, you need to have a little caveat. You have to say that assuming the number that you're dividing by is not equal to zero, in this case, assuming Z, uh, C is not equal to zero. And that's just so that obviously any number divided by zero is 
that's that that's just nonsense. It's not a real number. So now we have our vertical angle property. And it's just the, our definition is just vertical angles are congruent, but we don't really know what vertical angles are. And that's why I have it as demonstrated separately. And now finally, our last property of per perpendicular lines and right angles. So this is what a perpendicular line looks like. It is a vertical line on top of a horizontal line. It can also look like this or like this. You get the idea, just so long as that a vertical line and a horizontal line are attached. So it'll say that all perpendicular lines form right angles and all right angles are congruent or equal to each other since they're all 90 degrees. And here, 90 degree angles are represented by this little box. Instead of the typical angle, which is represented by an arc. Now I want to go back to the very first property we talked about, which is the reflexive property, that definition that was a little weird saying that an angle, line, segment, or shape is always congruent to itself. Now, we only use the reflexive property when there is a shape embedded within another shape. So let's look at this first example. We have this triangle A, B, C, which I'm going to go in with in this blue color. Then off to the side, I'm just going to write triangle A, B, C. That's the notation that we use in geometry to denote triangles. And next, we have this triangle, this smaller triangle that's within A, B, C, triangle D, B, E. And now similarity that these two triangles hold is that they both share this angle B. And so we can come in and say that angle B is congruent to angle B by the reflexive property. Now, again, it might seem redundant to say that something is congruent or equal to itself. Like, what's the purpose? But there actually is a practical use for this when we go on later, specifically for triangle proofs. But I don't want to get into specifics right now because that would take a bit long to explain. So I just want to get into the habit of recognizing that whenever there's a shape embedded within another shape, within another shape, excuse me, you want to get into the habit of looking for any shared characteristics so that you can apply the reflexive property if you need it, just in case. So we can look at it again with this triangle ABC. I'm going to go in it with a different color this time. I'm going to trace over ABC, and I'll write it up here. It's a different triangle, so I'm going to write it in a different color. And then we have triangle DEF. Now this time, they don't share a common angle, but instead, they share a common line segment. In purple right here, this line segment FC, they both are a part of the two triangles, or rather the line segment is a part of the two triangles. So now we can go in and say that FC, line segment FC, is congruent to FC. When we're talking about line segments, we want to draw a horizontal bar on uh, above the letters, just that we're very clear on that they're line segments and not just letters. So FC is congruent to FC by the reflexive property. Great. Now we can move on to our next topic, which is vertical angles. Again, this was covered in our little table, but I just want to go over what exactly a vertical angle is. And vertical angles are formed when two line segments intersect. And they're the pair of angles opposite of each other. So when these two line segments intersect, they form four angles. Angle one, two, three, and four. And so identifying these vertical angles, angle one and angle three are a vertical angle pair, and angle two and four are a vertical angle pair. And we saw that vertical angles are congruent, that is a property of vertical angles, 
So we can say that angle one is congruent to angle three because vertical angles are congruent. And you can see I'm abbreviating here. You can, um, instead of saying angles, you can write out that little uh, notation there. And instead of writing congruent, you can just write out the sign. And the same thing applies with angle two and four. Now I wanna to touch upon another really important part of geometry, which are parallel lines. And parallel lines are simply just two, a pair of lines, I should say, that never intersect. They're never gonna cross like this. Those are not parallel lines, but these are. They're never gonna cross. They're gonna go infinitely in one direction without ever touching one another. And parallel lines are usually coupled with the transversal which is a line segment that passes through two other lines. Now, a transversal doesn't have to pass through parallel lines. Like in this example that I just drew really quickly, this line is still a transversal since it cuts through these two lines, but they're obviously not parallel. But in geometry, when you have a transversal, it's usually gonna cut through a parallel line. So that's what I'll be focusing on. And when a transversal cuts through two lines, it creates some really special angles that are notable and that you want to memorize. So first we have our alternate exterior angles. I want to break down this term before we get into our formal definition. Let's look at this word exterior. Exterior, when I hear exterior, I think outside. Well, outside of what? I want to, first of all, highlight these parallel lines that I'm going to draw in blue. So when I say exterior, I mean outside of the parallel lines. Let's think of these parallel lines as like a fence or some sort of gate or bounding figure. We want to be outside of the parallel lines. So everything within this is interior. We want to be on the exterior, outside of the gate, if you will. So we're going to focus our attention, sorry, on these regions with the inside being a no-go. So they are, form they are formed on the outer side of two parallel lines and on opposite sides of the, of the transversal, sorry. That's where the alternate comes from. So let's take angle one, which we'll have right here, and angle two. They are, they are on opposite sides of the transversal and they are on the outside of these parallel lines and so they are alternate exterior angles. In the same vein, you have angle two and angle four, opposite sides of the transversal and outside of the parallel lines. So they are also alternate exterior angles. Now we have alternate interior angles. Now we have the opposite. We want to, I'm gonna redraw over this parallel line. Now we want to be inside this region. This is going to be our region of focus where the star is. And alternate meaning on opposite sides of the transversal. So they, they are on the inner side of two parallel lines and on opposite sides of the transversal. So angle one and angle two here are alternate interior angles, opposite sides and within the parallel lines. And within a similar vein, angle three, and angle four are also alternate interior angles for the same reason. Now, with alternate interior angles, there is a little trick associated with them so that you can find them a little faster. So drawing out a quick uh, sketch of what I have over there. You can draw a little Z along where the parallel line and the transversal meet like this. We have our blue Z there. And the two corners of the Z are alternate interior angles. That's how you can spot them really quickly. And in the same vein, you can draw a backward Z like this. And the two corners will also be alternate interior angles. That's just a really quick way to identify them if you're having trouble um, with that kind of thing. And now finally, we come to our corresponding angles. So they are formed on matching sides of the transversal. So now instead of it being alternate where we wanted them on different sides, 
Now we want to just focus on one side of the transversal. So I want to focus our attention first on this side, the left-hand side. So for now, we can ignore this right-hand side. They need to be on the same side of the transversal and in the same position. So for instance, this angle one and angle two are both corresponding angles because they're on matching sides of the transversal and they're in the same position. They are both above this line. They are both above one set of parallel lines. In a similar vein, angle three, oh, excuse me, angle three and angle four are also corresponding angles because they are on this side of the transversal. Now we're on the right and they are both below the set of parallel lines. They need to be in the same relative position. And now the reason why we went over all of those different angles was because pairs of alternate exterior, interior, and corresponding angles are going to be equivalent when a transversal passes through two parallel lines. And if they aren't parallel, then they are not equal. So this is, I'm actually going to highlight this. They are equivalent when a transversal passes through two parallel lines. So if you can prove that a, a set of angles are equivalent, a set of these specific angles are equivalent, I should say, then you know you have parallel lines and then you can work from there. Now we have some additional vocabulary. Now we have complementary angles, which are a set of angles that add up to 90 degrees. So we already, we already know what the general form of a 90 degree angle looks like, the vertical line with the horizontal. So if I were to have, let's say this be angle one, and then I have another angle, angle two, it's pretty clear to see that angle one and angle two make up a perpendicular line at a right angle. And so we can say that angle one plus angle two is gonna be equal to 90 degrees. And because of this, we say that angle one and angle two are complementary angles. In a similar vein, supplementary angles are a set of angles that add up to 180. And for this, I actually wanna backtrack to our this diagram with the parallel lines of the transversal. So a 180 degree angle is just a flat line. This is what we call 180 degrees. And so we notice that a parallel line of this stature, of course, this is a flat line. So we can say that the angles that make up this flat line are angles one and two. We have this acute angle, an angle that's, or rather obtuse angle, an angle that's greater than 90 degrees, and this acute angle that's less than 90 degrees to make up this 180 degree angle. And so we say that angle one plus angle two is equal to 180, and subsequently they are supplementary. Now, finally, we have this new term bisector. And so to bisect means to split something into two equal parts. And so there are different types of bisectors in geometry, but the line segment bisector creating two separate line segments that are congruent, that are equal in measure, and angle bisectors, which creates two angles that are congruent. They have the same degree value. Now let's go in with our first example. I understand this isn't a proof, but it kind of just reinforces the stuff that we covered so far because there's a lot of vocabulary and jargon, and this is kind of our way of applying it. So it is known that line segments A and B are parallel to each other. And line segment C intersects line segment A and B. I want to highlight that. So A and B are parallel to each other, and line segment C intersects line segments A and B. So we know that C is our transversal, and because A and B are parallel, we know that the three sets of angles that we talked about, the corresponding angles, alternate interior and alternate exterior, are going to be equal. So if angle one is equal to 2x plus 36, and angle two is equal to 7x minus 9, we want to find the exact angle measure of angle one. 
I want to look at this diagram a little further and see what kind of similarities or properties of these angles I can find. So first things first, I'm looking at this side of the transversal. And I see we have a set of corresponding angles. We can say that this is equal to angle one because these two angles are on the same side of the head transversal and in the same relative position above their respective lines. So this angle and this angle right here are equal to each other. And so I can say that this is also angle one. And now we see that angle one and angle two reside on this same line, line segment B. And when you have a straight line, we have a 180 degree angle. So we know that angle one plus angle two is equal to 180. They're supplementary. Now we're talking. We're going to sub in what was told. Angle one was 2x plus 36. And angle two is equal to 7x minus 9. And this is all equal to 180. Now we're going to combine like terms. We're going to have 9x minus 27, or rather plus 27, is equal to 180. I have my calculator with me so that I can make things easier. 180 minus 27 is going to be equal to 153. We just move this 27 to the other side of the equation. So 9x is equal to 153. And divide by 9 on both sides, we get that x is equal to 17. But this isn't what the question asked us for. They didn't ask us for the value of x. They asked us for the value of angle 1. And so I'm going to rewrite what angle 1 is equal to. And I'm just going to direct substitute this x into here. So we have 2 times 17 plus 36. And doing that on my calculator really quickly, we get that angle 1 is equal to 70. And just to check, we can plug in x for the value of angle 2. So we get 7 times 17 minus 9. And we get that this is equal to 110. And that checks out with our definition of supplementary angles. Because if we add 70 and 180, or if we add 70 and 110, excuse me, we get 180, which aligns to what we found in this diagram. Okay, now let's look at our actual first proof. It's nothing much, it's a pretty simple proof, but it says, given that angle seven is congruent to angle three, we need to prove that line segments or lines A and B are parallel. So with a proof, it's a very different type of math problem that you may have encountered before, where instead of just plugging in numbers like we did in example one and finding X and substituting in, we actually need to write. So we have a statement and reason chart. And this is how you want to format all of your proofs going forward. You're going to present a claim that you're going to put in the statement column and then a reason. So anytime they give you something that you have to assume to be true with the given, that should be your first statement. Angle seven is congruent to angle three. And your reason is that it's given to you. You don't need to whip out any fancy math terms in order to prove what they've already given to you. So I want to look at this. We know that angle seven and angle three are congruent to each other. Now, this should look familiar to you because they are on the same side of this transversal. They're both on the left and they are both in the same relative position to each other. Within these two parallel lines, they're both under their respective line, meaning that angle seven and angle three are corresponding. They're corresponding angles. And if we know that corresponding angles are equal to each other, or congruent, I should say, then the line segments, then the lines that the transversal pass through, I should say, are parallel. And so that's exactly what we're going to write. Our statement is that A is parallel to B, because angle seven and angle three are corresponding angles. And a pair of corresponding angles can only be congruent if the two lines that the transversal crosses are parallel. Now, 
This was a very simple proof because there's only two statements. Usually you would need a lot more, but this is our first proof. It should be an introductory one. But in later videos, when we learn more, we are definitely going to have more complex proofs. So that's it for today. I really hope you enjoyed and I'll see you next week.